I'm Amanda Zimmerman. I'm a Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt Continuous Improvement Mentor and have been doing this for about 10 years. I'm super excited to launch the Project Showcase where we can help to share some of these domain projects that we're doing and help people really understand what it means to be into continuous improvement and overcome some of those challenges. Uh, I'm passionate about making continuous improvement practical, possible, easy, no matter where you're at in the world, no matter what industry that you are in. So this is one of the reasons that the project showcase came together because it's an opportunity for people to see all of those different types of projects as continuous improvement facilitators, Six Sigma, Lean, it's not standardized. There's no way we can know it all. So by seeing these different projects, we can learn from each other, we can grow in our practice, whether we're new or whether we've been doing this for a long time. So I'm super excited to create this opportunity for us to network, but also to learn from each other. So we'll have six presentations tonight. Each of our presenters will have about 10 minutes to present. So what we have here for our project showcase tonight or today or this morning, uh, depending where you're at in the world, is we have these six different projects that we're gonna jump into. Let me just get set up here so that I make sure that we're following everybody along. All right, so Mateusz, how are you doing this evening? I'm very well and not even sleeping at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> So you're in Poland, yes. right? Yes, I'm in Poland. It's about 10 past midnight. Wow. wow. Well, we I'm already on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate you staying up. And then we also have tonight, we'll also have Kimberly Ward Barowitz, John Ireland, Eamon Sakur, uh, Rodney, and Dominic. So uh, we have quite a few awesome presentations for you today. Are you ready to get started, Mateusz? Mm, yes, I am. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and put on the timer for us so that we can stick to that 10 minutes, making sure that we stick to our timeline here. And uh, we can go ahead and get started whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, I think I've pressed this ask to be followed. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Can you see how yeah. I'm zooming? Yeah. Okay, that's brilliant. Uh, so hi guys, uh, my name is Mateusz Nowak. Uh, like Amanda said, I come from uh, Poland. I live in Poland, very close to the Krakow, beautiful city. If you want to come and see or visit, just please let me know. We can pop out for some kind of beer and talk about more Lean Six Sigma projects. <clears throat> If you want to contact me, please join my network. Uh, here are the details. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, why I joined today? <laughs> First reason, uh, Amanda invited me. But the main reason is because I like to meet new people and uh, check basically how are you doing with the DMake um, the methodology, the DMake toolbox. Uh, you can help me basically by uh, sharing with me your experience. I like uh, sharing knowledge. I like learn from other people. So uh, never say never, always good to, to talk with another expert. Uh, I like travel with my family. I've got wife uh, and three kids. Uh, I like dancing. I hate cold weather. <laughs> So in Poland, it's not very easy. And uh, I don't like discussions that leads basically to nowhere. But saying about our project, because we have only 10 minutes. So the main reason why we took that project is uh, lack of capacity. Uh, as a company, we were facing uh, working on six days, uh, what was a uh, very extremely big cost for the, uh, for the company. We wanted to get back on a five day shift. Um, and uh, the overall effectiveness, so the factor uh, I was looking at my very first Lean Six Sigma project was on the level of 88.3%. This is what was reported from the, uh, from the department. And the goal was uh, to achieve at least 91%. This is from the voice of the customer level and to be safe uh, from the company perspective was 93% to be achieved. Um, when we went to the define phase, uh, we of course created the project charter, uh, we put all the stakeholders, uh, we put all the team uh, that will be uh, doing this project without the Ishikawa diagram uh, just to you know um, find out what uh, 
key parameters have the biggest impact on our oil losses. Um, and we um, find out about about six parameters that have the very big impact on uh, on our OE. That was the cycle time, the changeover, uh, crane activities for the operator, uh, cutting saw, uh, I will explain that a little bit later, TPMs and uh, breakdowns. So all of them six. You know, in the green belt project, you would supposed to take one and improve one. But that was my first project. I wanted to do it big. <laughs> so I took all of them six within the same project. Uh, in the measure phase, uh, we received the data from the uh, manufacturing department uh, going from whole quarter, the fourth quarter of 2018. Uh, but I wouldn't be myself if I wouldn't confirm that data. So we've done a, a photography of the day uh, to find out all the informations that are in the reports corresponding to the reality that is on the, uh, on the shop floor. And unfortunately, it wasn't. So what happens uh, when the re reports are showing differences in few areas, mainly change over time, some crane activities, and something that was called as orders, and nobody knew what it is inside the, the orders. Um, so we couldn't make any improvement decisions uh, based on that reports. Uh, so we done some statistical analysis and um, for them uh, for them reports and call, uh, find out the the uh, free values uh, that uh, had got unstable uh, coefficients of variation and that was the, the stoppages called orders the changeovers and additional activities all related to the material movement so we took that uh, to very close uh, our attention uh, going to the improved phase, knowing that we had got differences between uh, old reports and the data that we have from the reports, we created new reports um, so we could find out more about the others. So we split them in a few categories uh, and then we gathered new data that we could make any decision um, on them. Uh, we created also the changeover matrix. Uh, that was done just for the planners, so they understand how big uh, impact on oil losses have uh, all the unnecessary changeovers. Uh, we also find out about the uh, vitality of the souls because wherever they were new ones put on the machine, the operators put the machine a little bit slower. Uh, and then when the machine, when the when the saw uh, um, had um, uh, sorry, I forgot the word, but uh, when the saw could cut at the high speed, um, the, new, the new saw could work, for example, for the thousand pieces, but whenever they, uh, they sharpened it in the tool, um, tool department, this took, uh, for example, uh, only 500 pieces for cutting. So the operators uh, didn't want it to, um, to lose on their performance. So they slowed down uh, the machine so that so, for example, could last for uh, the whole shift. Also, we uh, analyzed the, the cycle time. And what we find out that in the report, every piece had got the same cycle time, what wasn't correct because the, the cycle time depends on the material diameter and the cycle time was slower, like I said uh, earlier, due to the not sharpened correctly uh, saws. Also the potentiometer that sets the speed of cutting had some losses, uh, losses and during machine shakes, slow down uh, the cutting. So lots of uh, issues that uh, had impact on our overall eff efficiency. In an improved phase, I wanted to do just uh, share with you a few tips. Whatever you're doing a change, uh, just uh, don't make a change because you want to make a change. Explain to every people why and what is the true reason of that change. Then you will get much more support. If you're doing change, just to change, then every, everyone will, will be blocking you. 
Uh, one very important point, always make sure you work on the validated data, verified data, uh, as you may uh, make wrong decision based on the wrong data. So if we would take all the reports as a valid data because they were reported, so they were supposed to be okay, then we would make complete wrong, uh, wrong decisions. And another thing is try not to blame people, uh, but look closely in the process in which they work, mainly uh, the reason of uh, losses will be in the process, not particularly with the, with the people. So once we had all of that clear with the department, with the manufacturing department managers and the stakeholders, we went to the control phase uh, when we started to run the uh, run charts that will showing wherever we are outside of the um, of the OE level that is uh, minimally required uh, for our process. <laughs> we went to the specific detailed report what happened directly in that specific points so that could uh, help us investigate the true reason of of them losses. Uh, on the final results, uh, what was uh, unexpected actually, because uh, I was supposed to improve the overall effectiveness, but I actually I lowered it. Lowered it to 85%, but at least on that point, we knew that this was true value, the value from, we, from which we could uh, do better. We had a list of issues that were uh, supposed to be improved. And then um, going point by point, eliminating them losses, we would go up and up on the overall effectiveness. But from the other hand, uh, our productivity raised by 125 pieces per shift, and that took us much, much closer to work on the five days. So um, in overall, uh, everyone was very happy from that project, uh, although that was the first project. So we started to look for another opportunities uh, to do the Lean Six Sigma project in, uh, in our company. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> you did. Are there any questions? Do anybody, does anybody have any questions for Matish? I do. Perfect. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, saws in manufacturing are very near and dear to my heart because my first job, we used a lot of saws to cut aluminum. Uh, mm -hmm. Would it have been your opinion um, to replace those saws? Because you said that it was the blades um, that were, were running out. Um, is that a, a, a function of the, the machine or is it literally just a function of resharpening the blades by your own tool department? What would you have done uh, had you been able to do it all over again? Well, in that, in that point, uh, we had uh, at the beginning two solutions. First solution is always buy a new blade. Okay, but the new blades are extremely uh, expensive. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so from the other hand, once you uh, had uh, a used blade, you could resharpen it. Okay, but we made an uh, um, like an experience uh, or exercise to find out what is the uh, sharpening time enough mm -hmm. so the sharpened blade. Could, um, could work longer, okay? So we were looking, that, that so vitality form was created only to find out um, what person was sharpening that blade, how long did they do this, and how many pieces we actually could make from that sharpened blade, okay? Because we could see that uh, when you have a number on the blade and that blade comes fourth time on uh, sharpening, uh, it, its effectiveness was much lower than when you sharpen in the second time, okay? That makes sense. So we find out that after uh, free sharpening of the same blade, the fourth, it's, uh, it will not give you any extra value. So we will lose time on the sharpening uh, and we will lo lose extra time on um, uh, extra changeover because that blade will not last for the whole shift. Yeah. So once we find cool. it out, uh, we made a free, uh, free sharpening. That's it. We buy a new blade. And did you say this was your first project that you did? Yes, that was my very, very first uh, Lean Six Sigma Green Belt project. Awesome. That's really good. And I really liked and hear some of the things that you called out 
in your few tips, right? That we need to have that change, that we need to explain the change, the true reason of the change to the team. Yes, that was, that was absolutely necessary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, you know, when you, when you want to make uh, a change, when you go on the shop floor, uh, people used to work in their way. Yeah. And then they finding out there is a coming on guy who's, who's going to change on, on our daily routine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we need to meet with them, explain the financial reasons why we want to make this, because uh, uh, let's say cheating on the, on the reports uh, is putting these people in the wrong situation. Mm. because they were showing it's okay but it wasn't they didn't want to blame anyone but there was some uh, some process fault it's not the people it's a process fault process of yeah. sharpening that blades i'm not blaming people i'm blaming the process yeah because uh, that wasn't correctly managed uh, and uh, another thing is they had to suppose they supposed to work on saturdays so that's another extra day for them. Wow. Uh, it's not convenient to work six days a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone wants to have a weekend off. Okay. So we want to show them that if we improve that process, if you help us to improve that process, if you show us, tell us what is wrong, what can we do better for you, mm-hmm. then you will do the same work. You will work in five days and you will have a weekend off. It's a win-win situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the true reason of the change and the discussion uh, pays off. That's in my opinion. And the second point, what I mentioned, validated data. Mm-hmm. If we took, you know, the reports that were showing from the shop floor, because we were supposed to take them. Yeah. Oh, hi, guys. We've got plenty of reports. Every day, every shift, you've got report. Yeah. And we had reports from the whole quarter. Mm-hmm. plenty of data mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but not correct data yeah and I like you know in your example that you show there you can see that everything was a 5 and a 10 and a 15 and that's always a red flag to me that there's no 6s there's no you know it didn't finish at 17 it finished at 15 or it finished at 10 right so that's yeah. always a bit of a red flag but it's often something that we miss when we first start our project so that was an awesome catch that you had uh, to ask those questions. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the room. So if you want to continue talking to Mateusz, you can uh, go out of this room and come up and back as you please. Um, or if you want to just network with anyone or do any one-on-one chats with anyone. Thank you so much, Mateusz, for your presentation. Uh, awesome job. You know, it's awesome to get to celebrate these uh, with people all over the world right? That to me is really cool. And next up, we have Kimberly Ward-Borowitz. And you're going to talk about a project that we have around meetings, which to me is super exciting, because this is the project I feel like new green belts really often are excited about. Um, But, you know, they might try this as a new project, they might not. But, you know, there's always this one always comes up as an idea. So I'm excited to see a project that moved forward with it. Great. Thank you very much. And I'm glad you think it's an interesting topic. It's a little dry, but, <laughs> but it is so core to, you know, how, how we, how we function. So I, I, I can go ahead and get started. So, awesome. um, okay. So just make sure I'm zoomed in. So I'm Kimberly Ward, uh, Barowitz. I am a, um, I have a background in uh, program development and social impact project management, where I've designed operational systems and launched new initiatives at local governments and nonprofits. Uh, I'm based in Seattle, Washington, and um, yeah, happy to connect on LinkedIn uh, or in person if you're in the area, of course. Um, Really glad to be here. Thanks, Amanda, uh, for creating this event, and um, it's uh, great to see people's creativity come through in these projects. Uh, Today, I'm going to show you how I helped my team optimize our meeting workflow, uh, decrease our overall number of meetings, and improve uh, overall communication as a result. Um, So we all know the more users you have, the more complex the communication is, and uh, the more complex the work is, the more effectively you have to communicate in order to be successful. Um, So as just a little bit of background, when I first started researching project management as a formal career path, I spoke with a seasoned professional uh, who had uh, been leading projects and like big 
capital P projects for many years. And of course I asked her about her day to day and she simply sighed and, and said, oh, it's meetings, it's all meetings. <laughs> um, so, you know, meetings are, are gatherings and pretty much everyone has, has experience with these gatherings, either organizing them, attending them, avoiding them. And for many of us, it's just part of our daily lives, which is why I think this topic is so important. Um, how we meet and how we gather, it just matters a lot. So of course, COVID-19 really showed us how necessary it was to reimagine this. And as a result, we're meeting more and we're meeting differently. You see articles everywhere about Zoom fatigue. Microsoft Office has a feature that lets you block off time for focused work because it's so easy to lose your day to meetings. Um, and I don't know, maybe you're on a team where every meeting is productive and totally worth it, but I'm guessing that might not be the case for everybody. Um, so as a result, you know, many of us lost that ability to pop into someone's office or run an idea by someone before a meeting starts. And uh, many of us are still in that virtual environment and will continue to be. So what my team experienced is that those organic interactions now require some intentionality. So our initial reaction was to set up more one-on-ones, add more meetings to the calendar, stay connected with frequent touch points in order to bridge that gap, which is a noble pursuit. But what ended up happening is that we all just felt like we were meeting plenty, but for some reason, scheduling felt like it was taking a long time. Ownership of meeting prep was a little shaky. And in general, it just felt like we were playing telephone with a lot of our work. So I figure I set out to figure that out. And uh, the first thing I did was define. So let's set up a process. Um, what I did was uh, you know, just these three steps here. And um, it really that process documentation part is, is core to successful operations because it really forces you to put things on paper and plug the holes. Um, not only is it a really straightforward way to identify the easy wins for process improvement, uh, but it's also it also acts like a bit of a charter. It's it's best practice to get alignment on an SOP from everyone involved, and that, in my experience, has increased transparency and accountability because ownership is really clear. Uh, so we walked through these three steps. I gathered feedback. I established an SOP for the entire meeting workflow, from scheduling to follow up for internal and external meetings and kind of define that future state uh, for the SOP. We knew what we were doing for the most part, so how to, could we just make those little tweaks to make that uh, on paper as kind of the official SOP? And I have this little icon here, if, if you care to take a look at the workflow and, and see that as a template, um, if that's a useful resource. Uh, so in order to accomplish these steps, I do my best to act as a systems thinker. A key competency of this is uh, thoughtful inquiry. So asking open questions to reveal holistic information and continuous improvement and seeing the system as a whole is much more than doing a lean or looking at a static snapshot of a bigger system. When done right, it's a human-centered approach that requires knowledge of the interconnectedness of all the parts that make up the whole. So by the end of step three, we had a good and solid process. At least the meeting prep was on track, but that didn't really address the number of meetings or really address the root cause of the effectiveness or lack thereof of our meeting. So I took it uh, to the measurement section uh, part of that. Uh, and so we gathered all of our calendar data for a month. We looked at meeting length, cadence, if it was ad hoc or recurring, and attendees, uh, and also mapped out who was meeting with whom one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so you can take a look at, at those uh, pieces here. You gotta zoom in quite a bit because they're real tiny. <laughs> um, but uh, the next step was to, uh, do something with that data. And uh, that takes us to the uh, analyze phase. So I use simple pivot tables to visualize that data. And I was able, able to gather some insights and facilitate some brainstorming sessions to develop some solutions. So it turns out for a team of six, we had five team meetings a week, 13 different one-on-ones, where each individual was spending between 10 and 24% of their time in one-on-ones and each team member was spending an average of 54% of their time in meetings each week. So it was clear that everybody was meeting with everybody and that really eats into that precious time that can be used for focus work. Um, and that really is where there, there's room for more uh, productivity and creativity. So we uh, then moved on to the, zoom out just a little bit, to the improved stage 
And um, eight, uh, step eight was part of the, um, you know, just overall workflow automation. I used a, a productivity tool called monday.com uh, to save manual work that helped with meeting prep tasks. It created transparency for requests and uh, other work that for cross-functional teams and overall just helped improve the prioritization of our work so we could move together toward a common goal. Um, Number nine is probably what I would argue is the most important step, which is defining the purpose and being the pace setter for your meeting, which is critical. Um, you know, defining what's a huddle, a forum, a work group, a stand up. What do we do in team meetings versus one on ones? Do we even need this meeting? Are the attendees clear on why we need this meeting if we do keep it on the calendars? We have all this jargon that we throw a lot, uh, around and it's really what's the point? So. I took uh, a page out of Priya Parker's book, almost literally <laughs> called The Art of Gathering. And if you haven't read that and you're interested in this topic, I definitely recommend. Uh, but she really pushes people to define the purpose of a gathering and how it's up to the host to create the experience you really want your attendees to walk away with. So without a clear purpose from your meetings, it's, it's pretty likely that your attendees of your meeting are not gonna feel like there's a clear value. So, um, so I, one line on this poster, but really I can't emphasize this step enough. Uh, step 10 was to implement some of these recommendations and pilot them to see if we were feeling like it actually worked as a team. And as a result, we uh, found that fewer balls got dropped, people felt more in sync, we had a, a tangible result of fewer meetings on the calendar and people spent more time um, outside of meetings, which is really great. Um, <clears throat> we ended up decreasing internal meetings by 44%. And you can see right here the before on the left-hand side and the after on the right-hand side. And it's just so satisfying to me to see some of those little boxes go away. So that is, um, that's that's what we ended up with, which ended up saving our team a lot of time, which is, which is great. So for the control step of this, we adopted this process and, and really made sure that that due diligence uh, was part of the, um, process whenever we identify a need for a new meeting, uh, we ask those same questions and uh, make sure that people know why, why we're asking their time and, and, and what we're um, really intending that result to be. So we move to quarterly checks to make sure things are, um, you know, working just fine for us and, and that we continue to adjust along the way to make sure that uh, these steps are remain relevant and useful. So Happy to answer any questions that you might have, but that is uh, that's 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 my presentation. So thanks very much. Awesome, that was fantastic. I think one of the things that I I love the most about this is so many people struggle on projects around communication to show like a before and after, and this visual of before and after is wonderful to see. You know, you can really see that a change has happened. That that's important to me to make sure that there's a a, a little bit of you know that you can visualize that in some way at least so so yeah definitely yeah. nice to have it on paper. <laughs> it's a project manager in me. I like seeing those tangible results. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly, and people like it, right? Like this is so consumable that a manager or anybody you talk to you can show this to, and they can see really clearly the change. Thank you very much. Yeah, awesome. Any that's other questions? Ball. Yeah, actually, I have a question about the, uh, at the beginning of this project, didn't you have any fear that people will feel less engaged or be less um, interested in initiating meetings in order to you know, not disrupt this project uh, or anything? Mm -hmm. Didn't you have this concern? At the beginning? That's a great question. I think in general, the the organizational culture was feeling like there were just too many meetings that we were spending too much time and it really wasn't giving us the results. So I think that we were already really primed to, 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 to do something like this. There was an appetite there already. Um, so that was really nice. But I think in, in general, what um, once, even if there was some resistance to this, which there always is going to be with any change management initiative, the, to me, the, the real success is being able to see that on paper. I mean, really, it's, I, I don't think anyone would argue for more meetings, mm -hmm. um, but they, they would, I, I think, uh, would be a little hesitant to let go of some of those touch points. Um, so demonstrating the efficiencies behind it and really making sure that the value is clear, that's probably how I would respond to it. But 
thankfully there really wasn't any need for that because we were all sick of talking to each other on Zoom anyway. <laughs> Awesome. Good question. Okay, Any other you. questions? I do have one. So on the process map by step number three, were you surprised or anyone else surprised about kind of the complexity of your process map? Oh, yeah. well, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, I think the, uh, the, the gatherings that we host in my organization are such a key part of our mission. And so I, I think that you probably could get away with maybe a little less complexity depending on your organization's work. But the other thing is, is that I would also challenge that many process maps and flowcharts that I see maybe aren't as detailed as they need to be. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to, to find those that it's really easy to find those holes sometimes if you have to lay it out visually like this and ask yourself at every turn, like, is the handoff being accounted for? Are you able to, to really demonstrate where this work is going and who really owns it? So yes, it was surprising, um, but I really tried to simplify it and it really is that complex for the, for the most part for our team. So um, yes and yes. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it was a great, a great project to, to share with us. And I like how you brought, broke it down into these different steps as well. Awesome. Thanks very much. So we have the, the other rooms open, you know, you're welcome to move between those if anybody wants to connect one on one. Uh, we'll try to bring <laughs> Mateusz back. He's he went to the room, but uh, so I'm going to I'm gonna move him back to our uh, main room here just in a minute. Um, but Kimberly, if you if anybody has any questions that they wanna to continue to ask, you can ping her or uh, if you move into that presenter room, maybe just keep an eye on that and join them in there if anybody runs in there to talk more about this project with you or to connect with Perfect. you over there. Awesome. Right. Thank you so keep much, everyone. Room. Awesome. So next up we have John. How are you doing tonight or today, John? I think it's night for you, isn't it? It's late afternoon. Yeah, I'm doing well. Thanks. Awesome. So I'll just get that so that we'll be following you on the mural board. And uh, whenever you want to get started, uh, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. I know time zones are difficult to manage. And I know some of you are really late into the evening, but thank you for being here. Um, I'm the Chief of Innovation and Senior Process Manager at um, the United States Air Force Academy, um, currently in Colorado Springs. That's where it's at. And um, best way to contact me is LinkedIn, or you could reach me on my email. Yes, I still have a Yahoo account. Um, I joined today because I like seeing growth in people and organizations through small continuous improvement. And I think if you're not always continuously improving yourself or the organization you're just maintaining and at the end of the day it costs more money to maintain than it does to continuously improve because if you get to a point where you have a big problem because you you weren't continuously adding to that and um, to improvement then you're going to spend more time and money growing at that bigger problem um it could help me um, and telling me about any challenges or barriers you've encountered with your continuous improvement projects. Uh, let's see. Could you zoom into the I like because I have two screens that I split. Um, I like Kaizen events. Yes, I do like Kaizen events. And I often see people when I run these events tell me, um, we don't have time to run a Kaizen event. And it blows my mind because they do have time for an hour meeting, um, back to Kimberly's point, um, an hour meeting each week for the next, I don't know, quarter. So you have time to, to draw something out and continue going on the same path, but you don't have time to do a week's long event and dedicate that time at that moment. Um, so that frustrates me. Um, when people say that and they come to me and they say, we just don't have the time. Um, can't read that. I'm trying to pull it up right now. 
Are you able to zoom in on that? Yeah, if you, uh, it's actually following you. So if you navigate oh, it's on me. back to okay. your, uh, there we go. There you go. Awesome. I that. know it's confusing when we share the screen sometimes with the Bureau board, so. No worries. Um, I like travel and concerts. Um, I like working from home. Um, my job has the luxury of being able to hybrid work. So sometimes I go in certain days, sometimes I don't love coffee. Um, I don't like people problems. So when people come to me and say, I have this problem and here it is, and they outline it and we look in and start um, defining the problem and we realize it's not really a problem at all. It's not a process problem, at least it's a people problem. You just need to follow procedures. I don't like mean people. I don't people uh, don't like resistance to change, and I don't like um, changes to fit personal agendas or feelings. So, um, anytime someone comes to me with a problem and it's just, you know, their personal feelings that they need to change it because of X, and it's all to their personal agenda, then um, I kind of steer clear from that. Um, let's see. So, um, working at the Air Force Academy is a uh, college no different um in some aspects in most universities and institutions but very different in other aspects and when i say that um they deal with same problems as most universities which is parking um background is about four thousand parking spaces at the air force academy that um service about six thousand more than six thousand personnel that includes faculty members and cadets um, but there's only a small margin of those cadets that can park um, in certain spaces. So the problem that we came up with is between January 21, January 22, um, the cadet wing, which is where the cadets live, um, observed over 450 parking violations resulting in 279 tickets. So that would be our critical to X factor. That's our quality. That's one of them. And then an acceptable percentage of non-compliant vehicles, and according to the voice of the customer, is less than 200, so 10%. And we try not to aim super high and be aggressive and say we want to cut this down by 50%. We want to, um, yeah, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So 10% and then hopefully increase that. Um, and then identifying policing, validating, and enforcing violations takes approximately 40 minutes per ticket equaling about 185 personnel hours, and it costs roughly about $11,000 annually, and that addresses our next critical X factor of speed and cost. An acceptable time for parking enforcement should be no more than 10 minutes per ticket from start to finish if all the processes are um, adhered to and followed correctly. Um, so what we did was we took two SIPOCs, and it's difficult to see, but we took two side box, um, supplier input process output customer, and we um, started with the process and we mapped it out in the five steps uh, for each um, cadet registration and vehicle enforcement. And we um, looked at that as to how are we going to address this? Where's the, the problem? And those not familiar with the eight step, um, the Air Force, not DOD, follows an eight step diagram, which is um, like Dumaic, but the steps one is the um, define phase, steps two and three is the measure phase, steps four and five is the analyze, analyze phase, step six is the implement, and then step seven and eight are the control phase. So it's just a, an elongated um, Dumaic. So um, that's what we did here. Uh, breaking down the problem, identifying the performance gaps, we did a swim lane diagram of the process, and then we identified some Kaizen bursts that were potential issues, and those being the QR code stickers being misplaced and mishandled. Um, and then we also had a Pareto chart that we, um, we, we used to see like where the problems are and where's the time being spent. And in that Pareto chart, we identified old QR codes and no QR codes were um, pretty much the issue. And anything to the left of that dotted line, um, it, on the chart um, are items that if addressed will deliver the greatest benefit to us. Um, we set our improvement target for goal one being quality. We wanted to decrease that by 10% um, down to less than 200 from 279. Um, and then our goal of two, um, goal two was speed and cost is decrease the time spent on violations. It should be pretty seamless drive through a parking lot and they should identify who should be there and who should not be there. Um, and in this eight step, we have vector checks where we stop and we um, 
we pitch to the champion and we say, are we on the right, um, you know, target? Is this where we should be going? And then they say yes or no, and then we proceed. Um, so we proceeded with um, conducting the cause analysis. We did an Ishikawa diagram. Um, we did a pretty detailed and in-depth during our Kaizen event, um, breaking it down to how likely to impact and how easy to address. And those are those um, pretty much Skittle charts, um, circles all over the place that tell us, okay, is this likely to impact um, the change? Is it, how easy is it to address? Kind of like a priority matrix. And then on the right, we have the five whys of our two root causes that we're gonna address. Um, and then we circled what are the most implementable and easy to address. Um, step five, we went to developing countermeasures and implementation plan. Um, we just did the description, what countermeasure we're gonna implement, what root cause they're gonna address, what CPI method we used, um, and then the tools used that um, we um, implemented the countermeasure on. We had some countermeasure tests. Um, we introduced license plate recognition software and capabilities, um, tested about five times on sample of cadet and permanent party vehicles for effectiveness. Um, and then we updated and approved the policy and guidance for authorizing approved vehicles. And then we got the military police to bite off on enforcing after hours parking, which drastically improved everything. And then we have a pick chart with a priority task list of where our countermeasures are going to fall in. And um, most of our countermeasures are in the implementation area. Challenging, we had one challenging area, and that's this one that we scratched out at the end. Um, due to time, we um, our countermeasures, seeing our countermeasures through, we tasked people out on and assigned due dates on the completion. And we were specific and detailed as to what they were actually going to do. So when they left the meeting, they they knew this is my test, this is my suspense state, this is what I need to um, provide to the team, and then um, briefing updates as to where they were at to implement all these changes. After the changes are rolled out, we confirmed results and processes, um, and then we saw um, our goal was achieved of an average of 15.6 tickets per month, which comes out to if we were to continue this through a full year, it would be roughly about 180-ish tickets, which met our threshold um, and our goal. And then average time per ticket since we implemented the license plate reader software, um, we achieved that and reduced it to nine and a half minutes instead of that 40. Um, our standardized successful processes and control phase, um, most of it was standard work. And then we had um, sustainment for daily meetings and um, existing KPIs. Boom. Oh, wow, that was awesome. Right on. Sorry, I ran through that really fast at the end, but um, hopefully everyone's able to follow it. Again, the eighth step is kind of drawn out, um, mm -hmm. but it just takes the do make and just stretches it. And um, I, I emailed Amanda prior to this and I said, hey, sorry, I'm not going to have anything. I know I work in defense, but I'm not going to have anything sexy and cool that has all this data and metrics, but I had to get approvals for it. And this was uh, the, the least threat one that, that I could get approved to, to mm -hmm. show. So um, well, open I, I the think, questions. I think it's probably near and dear to some of our hearts as I feel like many of us have parked on college campuses before and uh, tried to navigate what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And am I going to get a ticket? And I have to go by, you know, like it's a challenge. So it's definitely a project I think we can all relate to. Awesome. And I know I have some questions, but does anybody else have any questions? All right. One of the things that you called out that I really liked was that you focused on the 10% goal rather than the 50% right, that you had like an achievable goal. And I think it's really common for people at the beginning to say, we're going to reduce this 75% or 50%. So what made you choose 10 over those 50 or those 75 that a lot of people jump to first? Um, dealing with college students and knowing that it's going to be hard to nudge them. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the change that are implemented and imposed upon um, college students they kind of just brush off, especially when they're not enforceable um, through payment because um, they're, they're government 
assets, so we can't impose fines on them um, mm. as cadets. If, um, if you're active duty, you can, but as cadets, we can't impose a fine on them. So it was difficult to push that. So we said, what is a, a, a measure that we could put in place that it's not so aggressive mm -hmm. that we can say success was made? And everyone in the room agreed that, you know, 10% was probably the average from the room that we all agreed upon. Good. Any other questions? And I like as well, you know, while this is focused on Demaic projects, a lot of us have different versions of Demaic that we use or that we've learned that actually, you know, still fit in to some of that same thinking. So it's nice to see, you know, other perspectives on that that are still using those different tools. And really it's what's right for you or what your organization is using that, um, that you want to focus on. So the other question I had for you was on your root cause analysis, your Ishikawa diagram. You have the red, yellow, green. And I think you mentioned really quickly what that meant. But can you tell me again what those indicate? Yes, they indicated um, the likeliness to, um, to impact the overall objective and how likely it is or easy it is to address and implement. So um, greens, all the greens, they meet the threshold of um, very likely to impact um, the, when we implement the change, um, impact on the countermeasure. So when we implement the countermeasure, how likely is that to implement a change? And then how easy is it to address? So the greens are easy to address and very likely. And then the reds are not likely to impact anything um, and then um, not easy to implement. And then, and then the yellows are kind of in the middle, like somewhat easy to implement um, and then somewhat likely to impact your overall. Awesome. Thank you. That's so just much. something I do. It's not, I, I don't necessarily see that a lot, but it's just something I, I like to throw up there for when we're um, hosting these kinds of events for people to say, I want to do that one. And then it's like, mm -hmm. well, let's look at it. How easy is that um, to implement? And, you know, is it likely to impact our, our end game? Mm -hmm. If it's not, then that's just a moonshot. So we'll just get rid of that. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we're new to continuous improvement, we think I have to follow A, B, C, D, E, right? Like I can't vary from uh, what's in the books of what I'm supposed to do with the Ishikawa diagram. But in reality, there's dozens of different ways that people use the fishbone to identify the root cause or select improvements. So it's, it's good to get exposure to other ways people are using them that work well for them, that maybe that works better for me than another approach. Uh, I had someone in another group call it a Fishikawa diagram, right? So we've got all these different names for this same uh, diagram, the CNX, right? Um, so I appreciate you sharing with us kind of something you've done that's made it easier for you to show others uh, what, what's going on in the project. Uh, any other questions before we move on to Eamon? All right. Thank you so much, John. And uh, awesome job. Awesome project, even though maybe it's not as exciting as, as some of the Air Force projects we do. Awesome. Eamon, how are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm doing good. I feel a little sleepy now. Yeah, <laughs> coming to us from midnight. the UK. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate your time, everyone, for this. Uh, and I thank you, Amanda, for inviting me to this uh, incredible event. Um, my name is Ayman Sucker. I am Principal Continuous Improvement Engineer at Dynex Semiconductor, based in Lincoln, UK. Mm -hmm. I have, I am a Six Sigma Black Belt. I have, doing this, I have been doing this job for 12 years now. Um, I joined today because I love to hear success stories. I love to learn from other projects when in other um, fields. Um, and you can help me by sharing basically the obstacles. What's, what were the challenges you faced when you were implementing your projects? These are the, the hidden secrets uh, of and the um, resistance during your change journey. So I love that. 
I love to hear about those. Um, you know, this is the knowledge that it is worth sharing. Um, what I love, I love socialization, uh, socializing with, uh, with other people. I love jogging. I love to watch movies all the time. What I hate is ambiguity. And I also don't like uh, creating conflicts. So um, moving to my project since we have limited time. So first thing first, in order to understand what's, um, uh, how did we found about our problem, you have to understand that it is, it, this is an example in the semiconductor industry, which is uh, a rapidly evolving industry. And R&D is extremely important um, inside the, the semiconductor in, in manufacturing. So uh, the management took the decisions that every part failed uh, on the field or you know, failed in inspection, we should get it back for full analysis. And we set a KBI that the engineers have to meet a deadline, which is completing the full analysis of, an, an, uh, of the part, which might take several days, in less than 10 days for every return case. So how did we know that we have a problem? The answer is in the define phase. So in the define phase, the management started measuring their, the KBIs. They have found that the, the engineering departments have failed to meet the uh, target. They actually only met 60% uh, of the target, which is a very, very low number. They were hoping for 80% of all the 10 cases to be finished in less than 10 days, but the engineers didn't actually met the 60%. And we noticed in the last year that there was an increase in the number of customers complaining about how long it takes us to actually resolve the complaint. So it is a complaint about complaint. Can you imagine? <laughs> so um, when I first uh, was assigned to, you know, uh, create this project as a black belt, I asked myself when they gave me these two failed parameters, are we actually using the correct KBIs to measure the efficiency of our uh, customer return process? And are the engineering department is the only one uh, accountable for achieving the right uh, time to you know, resolve the issue. The other question is, uh, well, if there are other departments, do they have other KBIs as well? So having all these questions, I kept them on the side, took them with me to the measure and analyze phase. So in the measure phase, which is the phase that for me, uh, I use to, you know, get as much data as possible, get as much number as possible. I started with the obvious number, the number that's actually being reported with the, the numbers of uh, total customer complaints, the number of customer complaints regarding delay and resolving issues, and the average uh, time it takes the engineering department to resolve the issue the, based on the uh, last two years uh, data. Um, then I start digging deeper using data from something called the customer complaint log, where we keep all the information about uh, any uh, return or complaint case from receiving the complaint until the resolution. Uh, I have calculated the average days it takes to resolve an issue from receiving the issue until the resolution. I subtracted this from the average days uh, the engineers take to create the analysis report plus the average shipping date uh, time, the time it takes the part to move from the customer's end to our stores. Then I found that there are extra 10 days of time hidden, not knowing anything about it. The, the, um, it is the time it takes other department to process the customer complaint, which was not ac uh, accounted for because this is, merely an engineering industry, engineers only focus on the technical part, but the admin um, activities around the uh, customer complaint is not um, put into account. So we started moving to other analyze phase. 
where we mapped our process. So in the analyze phase, I started mapping the whole process from start to finish, from the time the customer service receives a complaint until the part comes into stores, moving to the QA where they create something called the corrective action report, and then the analysis done by the engineers, review again by QA, and at the end, send an email to the stores for this position and for customer service team in order to confirm the resolution with the customer. We have started something called the um, value analysis process. We will look basically at every activity and label them as value added or non-value added. And we have discovered the following findings. First, we have uh, noticed that there are four different forms used in order to handle the customer uh, complaint, which is which um, include a lot of redundant data entry, a lot of information basically copied from one form to the other. And there was another uh, redundant data entry for using the um, customer return log was, was basically the a spreadsheet that the every department have to copy the information from their forms into this spreadsheet in order to you know, create uh, uh, some analysis or dashboard or something like that. And another thing we you can see here is that the engineering department was basically that the, the company think is they are have the high impact on the analysis process. They engaged in the uh, customer return process very very uh, late on the process. They not they don't know anything about the process until they receive an email from the QA department to let them know there was actually a turn case. Um, and this is one of the major problem we have. Another major problem, and this is on a strategic level, that the company took a decision to return every part, regardless of uh, what the customer would say. So this was very, very significant because we didn't listen to the voice of the customer. We didn't actually put into account what is the history uh, of this part, of this part was a customer. What is the technical background of uh, of this of this uh, technical issue we have? Do we actually need to return every part or not? So, we move to the using these all of these uh, findings. We move to the improve phase, where we took an action in response to every um, finding. So now customer expectations are not identified we have uh, guided the customer service team to start capturing the customer expectation as a part of the data gathering. So when we, they start to uh, gather information, they have to ask the customer what, what are the expectation and the engineering manager have to assess every um, return case and be engaged at the beginning of receiving the, uh, uh, the, the complaint so they can assess the feasibility of returning the part for testing and for, for analysis. For the customer return process, we have decided to use our um, ERP system in order to use one unified form, one function that everyone will look the data in. So no redundant data entry to be used anymore and no uh, uh, manual emails to be uh, sent, all automated uh, notifications uh, and we have also used these data to create a dashboard that provide live information about the performance. Uh, we talked about the delay between receiving the part and the start of the analysis process. So the engineering will now receive automated notification once every uh, customer complaint is logged into the system. And this will enable the engineering team to prepare for the analysis process. And once the part is received in the stores, they will also receive an email so they can go pick it up and not wait for the QA. Um, having all of these um, imp improvements to the process actually reduced, if we look at the future state uh, process flow, you will find that comparing to the original process, there are a lot of uh, non-value added activities have been eliminated. We actually have eliminated 40% of the non-value added activities using automated notification, using one platform on our ERB system instead of using multiple forms. And the, the engineering report um, 
uh, target of KBI have increased from less than 60% to more than 78% in less than two months after the implementation. We have now zero customer complaint about delay and complaint resolution. In the control phase, we have made several actions. I will just say this in one minute, if you may. Uh, we have planned a periodic audit above to ensure compliance. So we have increased the frequency of the auditing for the customer return process. We have updated our uh, procedures and work instructions. We have kept the QA inside the loop of the customer return process for a while in order to make sure that the new process is being followed and we can measure performance closely. Also, the new easily accessible dashboard will provide a visibility to the senior managers about our performance so we can take rapid action. Thank you very much and um, I apologize for the delay. <laughs> awesome, just barely over, just barely. Um, yeah. <laughs> so how have you found this with your controls? Did the dashboard or the QA system that you put in place, did that sustain it or is it still something that's rather new? Well, uh, to be honest, this is uh, the, the project itself is fairly new. It's only mm -hmm. been implemented this, at the beginning of this year. Okay. But uh, yeah, but using using an, uh, the ERP system, using the full potential of the ERP system, actually mm -hmm. make a, 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 a very, very quick impact to the performance of this process. Having a start, uh, I actually created this dashboard before uh, the, the implementation of the full project. And mm -hmm. we started seeing improvement once all the managers have visibility of their performance mm -hmm. and looking at different KBIs, mm -hmm. not as an overall performance, but on the product group level, they started having you know more awareness about the shortages that they have in their processes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Any other questions? Yeah, I really like that you developed that single source of truth, right? Where people can go back and everybody's using the same data because that's a waste that we often see. Yes, exactly. Uh, as I told you, they, the, the, the company, if you are working in an engineering-based company, you you quickly can overlook the admin processes, which might take a lot of time, which might mm -hmm. affect uh, the efficiency. One of the, the main problems we have is the engineering department have to wait for the QA to let them know they can start the analysis process. And what was the problem here is the part can be received in the stores today, but the the, the QA engineer have other uh, tasks to deal with. Mm -hmm. So he, he can finish this task after one or two days. This is mm -hmm. two extra days. The customer, we have an angry customer waiting for a decision. Yeah. And we only measure uh, the engineering department performance, but the poor guys didn't know, didn't even know that there was a problem until wow. two or three days of receiving the part itself. So. We actually we we, are, we uh, were measuring the wrong uh, performance indicator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that happened so much. Thank you so much for sharing your project with us. It was really interesting to see also the tools you used and what you went through. I think you said there's a lot of tools that you didn't include in the presentation here just because it was a summary. But um, exactly yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome job. I wanted to share. I wanted to, to, to share more and for everyone who would like to know more about this project you have my LinkedIn details you can um, uh, welcome to join uh, to, to, to message me and ask me anything perfect thank you so much Eamon now we're moving over to Rodney and it's still it's still evening but not quite as late for Rodney yeah it's uh, seven about seven almost 7 15 here in New Jersey well, a reasonable time yeah. <laughs> right, so. Awesome. I'm just going to get us following you here. Okay. There we go. So now we can see, see where you're at. And yeah, take it uh, away. Okay. So a little bit about myself. Um, I work at Golden Wolf, which is a government contractor. 
um, for the Department of Defense. So my project is just from a project I did over at a uh, previous organization. As you see, I live here in Clifton, New Jersey. Best way to contact me, um, obviously I have a Yahoo address. I forgot someone else. It's me and someone else for the last two <laughs> to have Yahoo addresses. Um, also on LinkedIn. Um, why I joined today, I really want to kind of see how everyone else does projects and also see if anyone had any questions about mine. Um, it's always good to see just different approaches, different tools, um, why someone used something, why someone didn't use something. Um, things I like, backpacking, hiking, mountain biking. Um, let's see, things I don't like, uh, extreme cold. I hike all winter. I'm good till about single digits. So extreme cold, you'll lose me. Um, that's pretty much it there. So I'm gonna kind of talk about this project here. Um, so this project was about improving the sign ordering process over at Sequest Aquariums. So Sequest Aquariums, 10 locations across the US, um, interactive aquarium touch fish, they have reptiles, mammals. Um, and I'll give a little view of what it looks like. This is kind of one of the rooms. You have exhibits here. So this is one of the signs. This is the gift shop. This is where those six and seven year olds, they're grabbing it, they're buying it. Um, this is kind of one of the signs as you go towards your room. Obviously, that's a fake shark, but all these signs are kind of what the project is, re is revolving around. Um, this is one of the exhibit rooms. So this is right here is they call a creature feature. So it's kind of a little placard in front of what you're looking at. It gives you a little history about the animal, where they live, what they eat, how big they grow, um, things like that. So kind of I'll give you a little background on how this kind of hit the radar as um, it needs, you know, a process improvement. So obviously you have 10 locations. Um, a lot of times usually the executives or the director of operations would do kind of visits to different sites, just kind of doing inspections, whether it's for safety, building inspections. And one thing they always complained about was either you're missing signs or I see a lot of handwritten signs. You know, I went on Word, made a sign, used some tape, put it somewhere. And that, that was one of the major complaints. And the sign process was run at a home office. So what the general managers would always say is, hey, I requested this sign three months ago, five months ago, six months ago, last year, haven't seen it. So I made my own workaround. So I kind of brought this issue to light and said, hey, our sign process is just simply not working. Um, we really need to kind of, this one's right for uh, process improvement. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on my current state map. So as it is, we have a general manager, COO, marketing director, someone in marketing, third-party graphic design company, and our printer. All these people are involved in our process. Um, one of the major pain points is because this was like very Google company, people would have to go on the on a Google Drive and look for signs that they wanted. So one of the main points was can't find it. We also found out that people um, didn't have access to all the folders. So when you look, you definitely don't find it. Um, we have a lot of approval, approvals in here. Um, another pain point was people didn't know the dimensions or materials of signs they wanted to order. That was a huge pain point because the printer will always ask you what size of material, and then you don't know and you go, I'll get back to you. That added to some of the problem. 
So, so the goals of the project, um, we want to reduce number of steps involved, had to eliminate kind of searching the drive because that was a huge pain point for the people submitting signs. Disorganized, couldn't find anything, and the permissions for the different folders weren't set. So some had access, some didn't. So I kind of put two charts here. We have not just is their process an issue, we also had a backlog. Um, so I kind of did a little characterize the type of signs. So creature features, those signs that are right in front of the exhibits made up more than 80% of the backlog. And let's see, as of August 18, there were still signs unfulfilled in the process from a year ago. So that really kind of showed that, okay, we're not getting to these and that's why people are complaining and signs aren't appearing at the aquarium. So this is kind of our Peter Fishbone diagram. This was a great exercise I did with the marketing team where we kind of had everyone go around and talk about, you know, in these different areas, what's causing, you know, the major issues as far as the process. And after doing a couple rounds of putting things on there, they identified three major things that are affecting this process. Um, lack of useful information being provided on the form. Two-a-day production rate, because we also found out that our graphic designer was on a subscription basis and that was the max they could do. So when you have a backlog, if you only get in two a day, that backlog's gonna grow as long as you're requesting more than two a day. And we also found out that we didn't have a dedicated person to take care of the sign process. So kind of went from here. And then... So after we did, you know, again, some brainstorming as to the root causes, came up with some countermeasures. Uh, and this is something we kind of went through our, you know, impact effort matrix and kind of narrow down a couple of solutions. So we automated the approval process. It was very email based and phone call based. So we found a Google add-on that was just a workflow for, you know, I don't know, nine dollars a month. You can completely automate your approval process. Um, we redesigned the form to get the marketing department the correct information they needed. Uh, we developed a sign catalog. So people will look in the catalog, put in an item number, and the sign was decided, the material was decided. So we kind of had that vision already where it's like, our goal was to make it kind of like an LLB catalog. Put your item number in, hit submit, it shows up. And that, that eliminated everyone having to know dimensions and materials, because that was just pre-filled on the item number. Um, we utilized an in-house graphic design resource we had, so we kind of got out of our subscription. So now we, had, we released that bottleneck. Um, and we use, uh, if anyone here has heard of Zapier, that kind of automates a lot of manual back and forth between Google, your spreadsheets and different things. So all the back and forth we took care of. Um, we used the Gantt chart to really schedule out how we're going to roll out the process. We started off three sites for 30 days, make sure nothing broke, called people every week, how's it going? Um, as it ramped up, we kind of included more, more sites because we also needed some more volume because we thought we're going to roll it out, we're going to get 100 requests a week and we could really see. Turned out we got like two a week three a week and we were like all right we need to roll some more people in here to see you know if this thing's working so that was kind of how we uh did the camp chart so this was kind of our process map after 
where everyone fills in assigned requests, put a workflow in, approval. If it's ready in the catalog, it goes right to the printer. No one else is involved. They get the order, ship it out. And uh, let's see. So the results, we reduced the number of process steps from 14 to six. Um, reduced the decision points from five to three. No longer spending time on the Google Drive. And we also made a form where you can now order 20 signs at once versus uh, one by one. So that's kind of, um, that's my project. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to be answering that. Awesome. Well, I think this is in super interesting just in the fact that it's in the tourism industry or in an aquarium, essentially, right? Like it's not the place that we usually think about continuous improvement. Yeah, but, it was um, so just a good old fashioned broken process that needed need, need to get fixed. <laughs> yeah, broken in so many ways. You had seven lanes on that swim lane chart. You had those access issues, which I imagine in your industry, you have turnover issues as well, which means that that access thing just keeps getting worse. Seven, was it five or seven decision points in this, right? Like five decision points and making a sign and then having the person have to know the dimensions and the, the type of, I mean, we're putting so much on individuals. Mateusz yeah. Dominic, did you have a question? Um, I just want to say to Rodney that this is a great example that the uh, Lean Six Sigma can be applied in any industry. It doesn't have to be necessary manufacturing. Uh, it can be office, it can be tourists, it can be finances, it can be everywhere. Uh, and uh, this is just showing that, uh, you know, simple Kaizen and simple Lean tools are great. I'm not saying they bad, they're great. But uh, Lean Six Sigma just uh, requires from you as a project leader to uh, dig deeply and uh, looking for answer on your questions. And when you get the answer, you open an eyes for everybody. You're showing the big picture, how the process really looks like. And then we can discuss how we want this process to look like and where, where should, should we do the uh, uh, true improvements to make that work for everybody. Mm -hmm. Shining that light in dark places. Definitely. Dominic, what was your comment or question? Uh, my question was, before you did that Pareto analysis, did you, sus did you suspect that Creature Features was the largest culprit? Because no. I love, okay, so that's, I was hoping you'd say that. I love it whenever <laughs> what somebody thinks that something is the real issue. And then you actually like pull the numbers and you're like, it's actually this. And then people are like, really? Come on. So that's, I was hoping that you'd say that. That is glaringly yeah. the biggest issue. Yeah. Yeah, no, I had no idea what it was because it encompasses like every sign in the aquarium. So you don't know what's in that backlog. And then you start digging and you're like, oh, these are clogging it up. And it's a lot of signs too. We're not talking, you know, when you talk about this, I think two, three signs a month or, but you've got a backlog of the creature features of at least 35 alone right so it's it's funny how these things just start to creep in and get bigger and bigger awesome well thank you so much for presenting rodney any other questions or comments for rodney before we hand it off to dominic our final speaker all right we'll get dominic started here thank you so much rodney awesome job really interesting project Dominic, I know uh, we have your project. You're going to be our final project, then we'll have a little bit of wrap up. I'm so excited to see so many people staying on board with us, staying up, some of us quite late, and uh, moving our, our topics forward, getting to hear all these different examples. Dominic and I, I know uh, next month we might kick off a bit of a little podcast that we've been talking about. So if you have any ideas for us, we'd be interested to hear some of those topics. We'll probably look at different Lean Six Sigma tools or specific problems to solve. So uh, that should be a pretty interesting thing that we get kicked off next month. So Dominic, what project do you have for us today? 
my project and am I hitting share screen or? I'm gonna go ahead and follow you on the shared screen. So we'll be able to, are you the visiting crab? Let's see. I believe so. Nope, I found you. There we go. We're now following you on the shared screen. Okay, one second. So wherever you move in mural, we're gonna move with you. I like that, that's better. Okay, so this project is titled Point of View Storage, Learning to See the Real Savings. I'm picking off of one of my favorite books that I read whenever I first got interested in Lean. Um, learning to see is great. Um, I'm gonna start off with the bio first though. Um, I'm an optimistic industrial engineer who is not afraid to make mistakes. I'd rather actually make the mistake first um, to get everybody else feeling comfortable about joining me. Sometimes that helps whenever you're doing Kaizen events or if you're making improvements on the shop floor. Um, I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but I currently work for a consulting company. So three days out of the week, I am in a different state all throughout the U.S. The best way to contact me is through my email. Sorry, I didn't put my Yahoo email, but I also um, still have one. So add three to the list. Um, and the reason that Barbara is there, because that is not my last name, I cut hair on the side and it's a great way to mix the analytical and numbers life with the physical and social life. And I've found that I've been able to make a lot of great friends in that process. Um, I joined today because I love to practice using Lean and Six Sigma tools. After this, if we are in a breakout room, please ask me about my many bins for my laundry that my wife hates. I'm up to seven different bins. And you can help me by putting me in contact with ordinary people who want to approach a problem from a lean perspective. Thinking back about just growing up, I can glaringly see that I just didn't have the insight into how to look at problems differently. And I think that's why I'm so excited about learning about all of these different tools. I just wanna show as many people as possible. I'm surprised that nobody else said this, but I love dogs. Um, I'm a big animal lover, and I have a dog. He's the best. I like teamwork. Um, I do not like being away from Gemba. COVID and hybrid work is a little bit difficult for me, but with this new job, I'm able to get out and see what I need to see. And I really, really don't like silos of improvement. It's not fun in, unless everybody else wins. So we're going to talk about point of view storage, and I'm going to be your guide into the laser manufacturing industry. So my previous company produced laser systems. And just so that everybody has an image in their head, picture a retro arcade machine, the same size, the same shape. And inside of that, what we're going to talk about today is called Product U. Product U is the literal laser. And the only reason that the laser was inside of this machine, whenever we would produce these laser systems, was to protect the operator and hold the part that they were going to mark. Um, but the main focus of this is with the third-party integrators and the customers. So we would sell the base product that was inside of the laser systems, product U, to third-party integrators and directly to customers. And they would implement these directly into their manufacturing processes if they ever needed a serial number or some other type of mark on the product that they were making. And these serial numbers outlast heat treating processes uh, years in the field so that you can recover that and have traceability for your product. It's a really, really, really cool industry. So my boss and I got together because this is, was a small company, maybe like 10 max people that were actually on the manufacturing floor, 55 people total in the entire company. So there was a lot of, of grumblings that the lead time for product you had increased from two to four days. And it wasn't just a minute. Um, when I started, it definitely was around two two days, but as our volumes grew and as we started to sell to more um, clients, especially outside of the US, the lead time for product U was definitely increasing. And what was like pointing at us right in the face was that we were losing trust from our third party integrators and we were getting customers that just were going to different products. So third party integrator lack of trust and customer erosion forced the president of the company to ask me and my boss, we need to reduce the lead time of product U. 
And that's what spun us into our product, our project. The first place that we looked was actually in the schedule. And um, the the part that sticks out the most is, and remember, this is a, an eight-hour shift, one shift a day type of manufacturing process. Um, the thing that was pointing right at us was that the kitting step in order to build this product was taking three days. We were we were allotting three days to just to get the parts from the warehouse out to the manufacturing floor. And those two destinations were only three, sometimes, sometimes three, but let's say 20, 20 steps away from one another. Um, it didn't make sense that it would take that long to get certain parts out of one part department and send those to another department. And the saying was, why would I wait four days to ship something when it takes four hours to build? So let's actually go into the analysis and the analyze phase and see how long did it actually take to kit those parts. In product U, there were 125 individual parts. And I broke that up into three steps, physically moving the parts out of the warehouse, digitally moving the parts out of the warehouse, and then moving those, carts, those parts on a cart to the assembler. Here, I'm using something that I actually just learned how to do. So this was a, a retroactive part of the analysis. In my new job, it's a motion study. It's called the Maynard Operation Sequence Technique. But if you guys have heard anything about third blinks, it's just a continuation on that. Um, I was able to use most to track out how much time it would take to read the part number and the quantity, go to the location, pick the part, come back, and then mark those two parts or four parts, however many you grabbed, off of the pick sheet. Everything was still done by pencil and paper. So that ended up taking 10 minutes. And I was able to kind of prove that now for this presentation using most. The next step was moving the job from the kit um, to the production area in the ERP system. That took about nine minutes. And then passing the cart to the assembly took one minute. So overall, this caused a lot of friction because if I'm saying that it's taking 20 minutes, but we're allotting three days for those parts to leave, where is the confusion? Why is that not happening? I'm going to answer a little bit more of that offline in order to stay along with the time. But in the improve phase, I can show some of the reasons that it was taking longer than it should have. Um, there were a lot of interruptions in the process. The first thing is in my beautiful PowerPoint layout, um, the inventory control associate couldn't fit the cart that he was using to store all 125 parts in between the inventory racks to snake and take the correct path. And that was just a huge burden on him. And he would forget certain part numbers or for certain quantities and have to walk back and forth multiple times. So this is just me showing that he would go to these many different places um, in order to grab the parts, hold them around like on his shirt or in his hands, because some were large, some were small, and um, take them back to the cart. Whenever I watched this, because I was in the Gemba space kidding the parts with him, I realized that the parts, the volumes of them weren't that large. And we were actually able to move 100 of the 125 parts directly behind the assembler desk. That eliminated the walking, getting, putting, thinking from the kidder physically, not digitally. And I can explain that part later too. The other thing that we did now that the kidder had to kit less parts was we were able to get him a smaller cart. And that number one was less trips overall. But number two, he was able to take a nice route throughout the, the warehouse and he didn't have to worry about walking back and forth as much. Also, now that all of these parts were within reach for the assembler, we were able to create something that we called the vanilla subassembly. And what that was was a base assembly unit that was able to turn into any product you that the customer could have asked for. And it was awesome. Um, we were so excited about that, that that's the only data that we used to prove that the project was successful. But now in retrospect, and the reason that I call it learning to see the real savings is because I could have used most to outline so much more time that we were wasting just with the movements and with the placement of inventory. But um, there's always something else that you can do. For the control part of this project, we ended up modifying the stock locations in our ERP system. And I can talk about how we finessed the way the ERP system actually saw those parts um, to 
eliminate the need to create more jobs and have more people working within the ERP system. Um, but we also set up a flag so that the receiving department didn't send those parts to the warehouse, but instead sent those parts out directly behind the assembly. Um, the other thing that we did was to curb our excitement, we created a space above the point of use racks to li limit the number of sub assemblies that we built. Um, because if we didn't do that, we would have started the worst waste, which is overproduction and produced until we didn't have any more inventory. And we start, we also added on more frequent cycle counts to the point of use space because it was easier to access uh, for the whole company. And whenever things are out in the open, sometimes they get stolen. Uh, but yes, five seconds left, I'm open for any questions. Awesome. That was, that's a really interesting um, project. Some of the things that, that stuck out to me with the cart not fitting behind and then where you moved things, did the kidder ever make these recommendations? Like the person putting together and pulling this must have like been raising their hand or saying there's a better way. Yes. And that's why, again, learning to see the real savings, aside from helping the customer and reducing mm -hmm. the the lead time at the point at which the order was entered into the system, I really saved the most time and money and well-being um, with the actual kit. Like his, because something that's not that clear is product U goes into every laser system that we build. So right now I'm just talking about us selling it as a separate item. But if there are seven jobs happening at the same time, that's seven product U's that have to be kitted. And that's where the measure and analyze step really ended mm -hmm. up making more sense it was just a, a question of priority and also mm -hmm. based off of Mateusz's uh original comment about validating and getting like the right data yeah. there's a whole other department that was asking this kidder for requests for rush jobs throughout the day mm -hmm. that was also muddying the waters with the schedule so we ended up not seeing the full picture from the beginning um, yeah. But just the overall like relationship between me and the kidder got so much better because I helped yeah. him so much. Yeah, that was the the real win. And John, did you have a question? And then Matias will will go to you after. Jeff. Yeah, I will have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I um, wanted to know if you've ever used or considered using a value stream map to calculate your tag time when you were looking at the time it took for them to pull parts. So you could identify the noun value added time and work from there. Yes, that is something that I definitely wish I would have done. In the, in the job that I had previous to this, value stream maps and Kaizen's were the norm. In this situation, with it being such a small company and with some pride, um, there were previous consultants that put value stream maps uh, gave it a bad name. Mm. So I had to find a way to kind of skate behind some of the larger buzzwords mm -hmm. and, and do what made sense uh, based off of what my boss and I thought of. And that's the part that I think was fun. Amanda alludes to this all the time. It looks different for everybody. Yeah. Um, I would have loved to go back and do that though. I'm right along with you, John. Mateusz, what was your question? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The data is uh, is a crucial in every project. Um, uh, but uh, I really like, you know, the, the the game by you actually done. So you need to go downstairs and look for the process by yourself, uh, mm -hmm. and then you actually understand what is going out. So if the kitter has got six or seven priorities done from everybody, then what's the true priority is? So uh, yes. yeah, that's one of the points. Um, uh, going deeper, I completely agree with John, you know, the value stream map is the first uh, uh, first tool that uh, you can use. Um, can you zoom in, please, on yeah. the assembly station? Uh, I will be much, much easier Very detailed everybody. assembly station. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I like that. <laughs> uh, you know, I used to, I used to be, uh, I used to work as an industrial engineer. So, uh, you know, whenever you've got uh, like a assembly bench and you need to combine and assembly lots of different stuff within the same station, even if this is one person or few people, uh, we used a tool called work, work combination table. 
Uh, this uh, is great tool and this will show you how uh, how quick with the standardized work uh, you can uh, what's the cycle time uh, you can achieve for example yeah and you can okay. achieve it by few few different ways you can or try to you know every movement of the operator you know use the stop and get the, the best possible time that they work on or going deeper there is a, a method called um, let me check quickly in English it's called uh, MTM it's a method time measurement mm -hmm. uh, when you've got actually standardized uh, types of movements if the movement is within I don't know 30 centimeters it's a easy pick up like you know pick up the glass it takes mm -hmm. no longer done yeah so this is uh, another great tool to go deeper and deeper to standardize your work uh, working time on the bench i like all of that thank you so much awesome I have a question yeah, yeah go ahead Rami. so and i don't know whose idea it was when you made a product you assembly area on the side did everyone just kind of really stun that it could be done because i know sometimes when you just say 100 percent here People were well, just like, yeah. yeah, the 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 first comment was there's no room, but um, with with some creative thinking and also in combination with the with this, I started Kanban, which moved mm -hmm. a lot of the space, a lot of the uh, materials that were in that space to another space, and reducing the inventory by using the tube in Kanban system, then created this space for me to put the point of use racks. So I built a lot of racks from Uline in the span of a month and just a lot of head shakes from the naysayers, not believing it. Uh, that happened a lot, but it was fun to kind of work within your own world and just see like, can it really work? Mm -hmm. and, and like I said earlier and alluded to, the, one of the other great feats of this was how we finessed. The, the, the ERP system still thought the point of use racks were in the warehouse. So we didn't have to create jobs or have people jump out of there to go and get the parts from the point of use racks. We didn't have to really do anything with creating more access. And that was a big, big ask to get past the uh, supply chain department and the people that controlled the ERP system. But once they saw that we were decreasing the burden on the inventory um, control person and the assembler actually liked to build that vanilla subassembly, um, their fears were a little bit um, deflated. So it's it's all because of Kanban. I love Kanban. And that changed a lot of minds too. Yeah, thank you so, so much. Yeah. yeah, it's so wonderful to see how all of us are using the same tools, but in different places with different results and different uh, applications, right? So there's so many different examples of that here today. And that was really cool to see. Thanks so much, Dominic. Marie has kind of a question that's a little bit more general, which is what ERP software do we use? Would anybody like to share what ERP software they use? Or Marie, would you like to expand on that anymore? No, that was the right question. Great. And I'm sorry, Dominic, what book were you referring to? It's a, it's a book called Learning to See, and it explains yeah the benefit of value streams and value stream mapping in just production environment anywhere really but the the importance of setting up that structure of who reports to who they have really good examples in there lots of pictures <laughs> well, learning to see books are fantastic for value stream for poll uh i know they're expensive on amazon uh they mm -hmm. seem to be a bit hard to find but they are really fantastic books to to have in your it's a series there's I'm gonna put a link. Them, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna put a link to the one in the chat. Thank you. So we have Infor. It sounds like Dominic, that's the ERP software you use. Does anybody else have an example of what they use that they're willing to share? Um, in my previous company, that was two companies ago, <laughs> they used a system uh, uh, called Match IT. Uh, it's very popular in the UK. I'm not sure is it available in uh, in US. Awesome. Drop that link in there. 
Great. If, um, you know, if, if we want to connect at all, Marie, hopefully we're able to, to reach out to you if uh, anybody wants to add anything else to the ERP softwares that they use or any recommendations. Uh, again, thank you to everybody for staying today, for listening to the presentations, for interacting with each other and being willing to share, right? It's not easy to, to come here today and share these projects. So it's super exciting to me to see these examples. Essentially, you know, if you were at a big organization, you might be able to go to a project showcase or a poster session and see these, but we don't always get that opportunity, right? So it's wonderful to get that opportunity today. Uh, the Finish Your Green Belt program, if anybody's interested, it is 12 weeks. It kicks off July 20th. It won't be in this time zone. So <laughs> our next project showcase will be in November, and that will be more in the UK's time zone, so the Europe and Africa time zone. So hopefully we'll have some different students that are able to attend that that weren't able to attend this time. The recording of this, if you're interested, will go up on the YouTube channel next week. And then if you want to reach out to me, I'm just dropping kind of all those links in the chat as we start to wrap up here. Uh, any other questions or comments as we kind of talk about all the cool stuff that we heard today? <laughs>